Welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at another Emotet document, one very similar to the sample that I analyzed in my last video. But with this document, we're going to really focus on how you can leverage the Office IDE, the integrated development environment, in order to facilitate or even enhance some of your analysis. So in order to get started, we'll just do some real quick analysis in order to get our bearings on this particular malicious office document. Um, as you can see, the content of the document contains some rather generic social engineering, certainly uh, an image that has been used in a lot of the recent Emotet campaigns. You can also see really the, the telltale based off of the network traffic of, a, of an Emotet infection. Um, that is the, the different URI structure, the random characters that follow behind the use of the IP address in order to communicate with the C2 network. We can also take a look at the threats tab and we'll see here that we have a number of IDS alerts that are very specific to Emotet. In addition, we can look at the process activity and, and while this is not a, a unique pattern, it certainly fits the pattern that is Emotet and that we have our office document that executes a PowerShell script which is then responsible for downloading the next stage and executing that. And then we get into the actual behavior of the Emotet Trojan which we're not going to focus on in this video. What we're interested in is still examining the Office document. So we're really looking at the winword.exe, that process, and the PowerShell that it spawns. As you can see, I've already downloaded the sample, so we're ready to run it through OLE dump. Doing so without any arguments will give us this table of contents. And you can see that with this particular sample, there are a number of user forms. Remember, those user forms are identified with OLE dump by the trailing F and zero. Inside of those streams, those user forms, this also gives us a name. And if we scroll up a little bit in our output here, you can match up that name to these streams, particularly the streams that have a lowercase m next to the index. So those are the macro streams. The lowercase m indicates that there are no actual macro content, but those are associated with the user form and would normally be associated with events that were tied to controls on our user form. So a button click or a drop down menu when that menu actually drops down. So from this particular document, other than having a significant number of user forms, we really only have two streams that contain actual macro content, streams 66 and 71. In order to extract that content, we'll use OLE dump with the argument of dash S and the stream index, dash V to decompress, and then we'll just redirect that to a text file. So if you want to follow along, go ahead and run that command on both streams. I've already done that. The macro content is now saved in a file, and we're ready to move on to use some sort of a text editor. It's helpful once we've opened our macros in a text editor to apply the syntax highlighting. And using something like Visual Studio Code does have Visual Basic as the syntax highlighting already available. Um, from here, you'll see a very similar pattern also to the document that we analyzed in my previous video. And that we have one stream that simply defines the document open event and then calls this method. And we'll find that method, of course, to find in the other stream. And I generally just use a find to actually locate where that function is in fact defined. Um, Scrolling down a little ways here, uh, just to get this content centered, we'll see that the first statement after that function is the assignment of this string to this variable. And you'll also notice that we have what appears to be this repeating pattern or this token, uh, also something that we've seen in previous analysis. And this value is just being replaced. And we can confirm that very quickly by noticing that after this dv variables declared. We have fd that contains just that token. And then a little bit further down in the code, uh, this string, so we have this additional string plus this dv that was defined above, is actually split using that token, which is fd right here. So that pattern's removed and what is resulting is stored in an array. And that array then is eventually condensed down or concatenated, each element's concatenated with the empty string. So that's how we get our string back. Now, had we not done this analysis before, it might have taken just a little bit longer in order to really unravel some of the logic here. And certainly if you're new to analyzing malicious office documents, you can get tripped up in a lot of this additional code here. As I mentioned in our previous analysis, this is all just junk code. One method that I have found to be very helpful is in actually running through the code using a debugger when I can. Because 
stepping through the actual code will show us what instructions are executed and which ones ultimately are ignored. So at this point, let's switch over to a Windows VM so that we can analyze the sample using the Office IDE. Once we've moved over to our Windows machine for analysis, we need to actually open up the malicious Office document. Now, a uh, funny thing is we do need to actually enable content. We, if we don't enable this content, then we can't debug the macros. We can't step through them. So we'll have to come back in a moment and actually do enable that content. But for now, we can just leave it disabled as we explore the, uh, the IDE here within the Office Suite. In order to inspect the VBA project, we need to have the Developer tab available. And the default setup in Windows is that that's actually hidden. So what you need to do is go into File, Options, customize the ribbon, and then select this checkbox next to Developer. Once you do that and select OK, then this tab up here in the upper ribbon will become available. From there, you can select Visual Basic, and that will open up another window that contains the VBA project. You'll see that there's already a window open that contains our macro code. Let's just close that and get it out of the way for a second so that we can explore the project view. Over here, we have the word objects, and you'll see this particular object here with a name that is just gibberish. Double-clicking that, though, will open up that actual macro stream. You'll see that this is our document open, and it's calling the function that we've already analyzed. So this is where some of those macros are actually stored. We don't want to analyze that anymore, so let's get rid of it. The other location, then, is the modules. And if we open up this, we'll see that here is where the bulk of the macro code is contained. We have not only the ability to analyze the code as we did extracting it with OLE dump, but we can jump around to some of the functions that are declared here using this dropdown. In this case, there aren't that many, so it isn't nearly as helpful. We'll also be able to explore the forms. And if you expand the forms, you'll see that here are all of the forms as we've already identified using OLE dump. What we can do now is we can actually look at the content on these forms. So let's just pick one at, at sort of at random here, and that I can see that there is a variable in which there is some concatenation being accomplished. That, that is, different values are being concatenated together and assigned to this variable. This seems to be the pattern of any statement that is of any importance in this particular obfuscation scheme. So we can look at this particular variable here, yfuz, and we can find that it is defined as a user form right here. The dot then indicates that it is accessing a control on that user form. And in order to find this particular control, then we need to actually open up that user form. So just like with the macro streams, we can double click and we'll see that now we have that user form. Now, they appear empty when you first uh, open those up, and there's a number of reasons that that is. One is that, as you saw, the, the canvas was very small. The other is that usually there's any number of other objects or controls stacked on top of that, and that as we begin to move those away, we'll be able to find different controls, different objects of different types. We have drop downs, we have radio buttons, we have another drop down here. So we were looking for a very specific object just as an example. If we go back to our macro stream, uh, this particular control starts with JKER. And if we jump back now to this particular form, the way that we can identify the name is by selecting those different controls and then over here in the properties tab you'll see there is the name of that control. So we can now scroll through these until we find what appears to be our object. Not only that, but now we can also interact with the object. If we wanted to you know, specifically extract the content that it represents, we could do that either directly from the object or through any number of properties here in which the content might be stored. The last thing that I want to explore in this video demonstration is just how you can use the debugger in the IDE. So let's scroll down a little bit further and get to a point where we might be interested in performing some dynamic analysis. That is, we want to be able to see information about a specific statement, but we don't necessarily want to have to do all the work of tracing through it statically. With this sample, uh, we have the function call to create. And we know that from analyzing the macros from our previous sample, that this is a process object. So that's what's responsible ultimately for starting PowerShell and executing the Base64 encoded script. That means that if we set a breakpoint here, we should be able to see or inspect the values of these different objects. 
So you can click in the left-hand margin, as you see I've just done, in order to set a breakpoint. And much like any debugger that you've worked with, that turns the line red, indicating that when execution gets to this statement, it will pause. Once our breakpoint is set, the next step is to actually begin debugging. Now, it's important that we're pretty confident that the breakpoint will actually be encountered because if we begin executing the document and we don't encounter this breakpoint, then it's gonna execute and we're not gonna be able to slow down or, or pause the execution of this malicious code. In this case, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna break here. So the next step is to hit the little play button up here in the upper toolbar. Now, I mentioned here at the very beginning that in order to begin debugging the macros in this project, we actually need to enable content. And that's what this dialog here is telling us is that the macros in this project are currently disabled. Now, there are some clever workarounds in order to get macros enabled without directly executing this content. But because this is an analysis VM and I do not have it connected to the internet, I'm okay with just simply enabling content and then coming in here and stepping through the code again. One of the main reasons I say that is because we already know what's about to happen and that the PowerShell that's going to be executed is simply designed to download the next stage. And if it fails, then that's all there is to the document. So let's go back to the actual content of the document and allow that content to be enabled. Now we're ready to begin debugging the program. Once we begun execution, you'll see that when our breakpoint is encountered, it actually turns the statement that we're currently at yellow, as well as places a little yellow arrow in this margin on the outside of the code. Now we have the ability to inspect the different objects. Sometimes you'll be able to hover over them and you'll get a little tool tip or a window that'll pop up to tell you the current value or status of the object. We can see that ER is empty. Other times you won't and you can take any object though, any parameter and right click and add a watch. What this will do is it'll allow you to trace that variable through the execution of the code. So we'll just go with the defaults, click OK, and we'll see that down below in the watches window that opens, we have a value of that variable dbtddjtr is our PowerShell command. We can add watches to really any variable type. And for those that are not just simply strings, it can give us different perspective or view on that actual object. So we know that this one is responsible for creating our process. And if we add a watch, then we'll be able to inspect different aspects about this particular object. From here, you can explore different properties that are associated with that particular object. And in this example, by looking at the path property, we can see that we have a Win32 underscore process. So that can give us deeper insight into how this particular object was used in order to create this process. Now, so far, we haven't tried stepping through any of the code. If we want to do that, we don't actually have the toolbar needed at this point in time. So we need to go under View, Toolbars, and select Debug. I usually just dock that up above, and now we have all of the normal functionality that comes with a debugger. We can stop debugging, we can continue execution until either the code is done executing, or we reach our next breakpoint, as well as we have the ability to step in, step over, and step out. So let's stop execution here, and let's actually go through an example of how this can be helpful in dealing with the obfuscation. I'm going to go to the document open function and set a breakpoint on that first function. Now when I begin execution, it stops with the very first thing that is called in the macros. In order to trace into this, we need to use the step into instruction, and this will step us into that function. Now we can continue to step into other function calls as well as step over, so execute those functions without tracing into them. You also have the ability to step out, but at this point, if we were to step out, we would go back to where the document open function was called. There's nothing left in that function, so all of the main functionality would be executed and we've missed everything. Let's step over. So we'll go a line at a time, not stepping into any additional function calls. We can see now that we have our long string that has been concatenated and assigned to the DV variable. So we could stop and inspect that if we wanted to. What we're interested in though is how much of this is actual obfuscation. And if you continue to single step, you'll see that we do enter the loop. So we could take a moment and inspect these values here. However, one trick or technique in further trying to identify this as simply obfuscation is to look at what statements are evaluated and if they have an impact later on in the code. So we just executed these three statements, each one having a variable that was assigned some sort of a value. 
However, these variables are never used. There's no other place that they are used later on in the code. And one way to test that is to simply do a find. We can see that by opening up the find dialog and pasting the value of that variable in, um, it's not used anywhere else, which means that the impact is pretty minimal. Now, you also have to consider what was assigned to it. And in this case, we have uh, some functions that are just being called to do some sort of mathematical operation. It's possible that a function could be defined that does something useful that returns a value to a variable that's never used. So we might have to trace into some of those functions. But in this case, since these are just built-in functions and returning some mathematical value, assigning them to a variable that's never used, then it's a pretty good assumption that it's all just part of the obfuscation. Seeing that pattern repeat is another indication that it's just obfuscation. And we're really only focused on the handful of statements that are doing any sort of concatenation and then tracing those variables from there. Well, that's all I have for today. So I hope you learned a little bit more about using the Office IDE in order to help with your macro analysis when looking at malicious Office documents. Please feel free to reach out if you have any feedback or comments for me, and I'm looking forward to continuing to produce malware analysis videos for you.